<coughs> Morning, everybody. Morning, everybody. How you doing, Kenny? Hello. We're uh, we're going we're going off off to, uh, chap off title here right now. We're going to be uh, playing things a little bit differently. Yeah. But uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Welcome to Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship. Yeah. And uh, we're going to start. Uh, Paul Taylor's going to come up and uh, read from Psalms 91. Yep. Huh? Hand? My Bible. Okay. Come up here. The back there. My Bible back there. Right. 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 Okay, everybody, I'll uh I'll read the whole whole thing and I won't yeah. make you read this morning. Yeah. And Psalm ninety one is uh, talking about the security of the godly. <clears throat> He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall by the, at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, my, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And the Lord always blesses the reading of his word. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, we're all going to get you all to stand now. Hymn number 502, we have a story to tell. 502. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
seated. Yeah. Call upon Carol Hill to come up for the prayer. While he's coming, I just want to prime the ladies because we're going to be singing a special song tonight, and you're going to sing it. <laughs> Should I pray for them? <coughs> no, we've got some good singers here. We thank the Lord for them. They, they even call them men up to sing sometimes, so that's pretty yeah. cool. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your loving kindness. And as we just get on singing, we, we pray, Lord, that your light will shine here in this place. And from here out to other places, we pray that people will open the word. We thank you for the word of God. And we pray, Lord, that you'll speak through your word today by your Holy Spirit. And draw us to yourself with all our heart, that we might serve you with all our heart. And we pray for those who are not well and struggling. We pray you'll meet their needs and encourage them too. We know others are going through other struggles. We just ask, Lord, that you'll just bless each one and help each one to realize that our real help comes from you, even if it's just gone reading. And so we just thank you, Lord, that you're a good God and you always you care for us. Help us to understand that and help us to cast our cares upon you because we do know that you care for us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Um, I have a few announcements I want to bring. Uh, when, when, as you enter today, you probably would have seen this on the table. If you didn't, they're out on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Can, Kenny's got his. So I'm just going to read a few of these announcements just to uh, refresh everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, Jacob Brewer is going to be preaching today yeah. in the morning and the evening service at 6 p.m. Uh, prayer Bible study will be on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Yeah. Uh, the youth group has signed up with an Adopt a Highway to help care for the Wards Creek Road. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be picking up garbage along the road on May the 13th starting at 1 p.m. And if you're able to join them, sign up sheet is in the foyer up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's located between the two bathroom doors. Yeah. Um, attention men, there are plans in making in the making for the men's breakfast starting, uh, it's on Saturday, May the 6th at 8 a.m. at JJ's. Yeah. And there's, a, there's also a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer. You going, Kenny? I love JJ's. Yes, I, I love JJ's. I like breakfast. Yeah, I like breakfast too. Uh, dates to remember. We have uh, May the 25th, so you want a closing. Yeah. June the 11th is the uh, graduation, uh, graduation Sunday for, no, wait a minute. Now, June the 11th is for graduation Sunday, yes. Then uh, June the third or July third to the seventh is for VBS. Uh, August the eighteenth and nineteenth is the giant flea market. September the tenth is the harvest picnic. September seventeenth at eleven a.m., John and Linda, Linda Began will be sharing with uh, a luncheon. To, uh, with, sorry, John and Linda Began will be sharing with a luncheon to follow. <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, ANBC grocery. Grocery grabber coupons are up on the bulletin board at the front doors. Grab a coupon, or, th or three the pastor put here. Purchase the items and bring them back with the coupon to the uh, church. Uh, Erica Cripps is putting together a schedule for special music on Sundays. If you're a member and would like to participate in this service, please talk to her. If you're not a member, would you consider becoming one? There are three basic criteria, save, baptism, willing to submit to the leadership and doctrine, the position, the fellowship. And we're gonna be starting this. Yes, I'm gonna turn it over. Thanks, Grace. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, on the other side of the uh, bulletin is yeah. you have uh, Ladies' Day at Hampton Bible Camp. Now that's uh, Saturday, May 27th. Registrations at 9:30 between 9:30 and 10:15, and uh, it's just a relaxing day of fellow fun, fellowship, and faith. The speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Marsha Boyd Mitchell from the Christian School. Fifty-five dollars per person. Lunch and supper is included, and there's a registration uh, website address there. Yeah. Also below that, Hampton Bible Camp is having their sp spring banquet drive th through a s drive through and or sit down. Uh, Saturday, May 6, 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, I, I assume that's at the Hampton Bible Camp. Yeah. And uh, you can pre-register as, as well, and then there's a, an address on there. So if you haven't picked this up, you can pick it up on the way out. There's still some out there. I saw them. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. okay. So I'm going to get, uh, we're going to have a few choruses. So I'll get everybody to stand again. And we'll start off with singing hymn number from the chorus book, hymn number 100. I'm so happy. 
I'm so happy, here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and gave me And uh, hymn number 15, There is a Redeemer. Two hundred and twelve, he's able.
13 to 25. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. First Peter 1, 13 to 25. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. Please follow along as I read. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And God has promised to bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, just reiterating what I said earlier, I need, I need the ladies to get prepared. We're uh, going to call you up here, and you're going to sing here t- to the audience. So just, yeah. just, just to get your legs warmed up. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number uh, 41, Holy, Holy, Holy. Yeah.
run this or am I running it? No, I'm yeah. okay. <laughs> so I'm looking for volunteers, female, come up. Don't rush. <laughs> Don't be pushing people over to get up here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be singing uh, hymn number 290, yeah. uh, For the Love of God. Ask some men to do that. Would this many come up?
they sang it a lot better than I could, I know that. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, Jacob Brewer is going to be uh, bringing the message today, and I'll uh, turn the podium over to him. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's take a little swig of this. Praise the Lord. Um, Praise the Lord for you. Graham mentioned men's breakfast this Saturday. I think Jordan and I have been kind of organizing that. Yep. Last a little bit. And so if you're a man here this morning, we would love to have you come join us at JJ's next, this coming Saturday, 8 a.m. Yeah. Yep. Um, a friend, a good friend of mine, Brock Casey, spent some time in northern Quebec in a, the First Nation Reserve up there for... Probably two, three years, I guess. Anyways, some by himself, some with his wife. And um, anyways, he um, God drastically changed his life about 10 years ago, right before him and I met and he came to Bible school. Yes. And so anyways, he's got a great testimony. And uh, so I asked him to come share um, at that. So I'm sure that'll be a blessing. So yeah, so we I think we rented the conference room and stuff there at uh, JJ. So there should be lots of room. And you know, if anyone needs a ride or something, let me know. Or Jordan, Jordan's here somewhere. Anyways, but uh, let us know. We'd love, love for you to join us. Um, turn your Bibles this morning to Psalm uh, chapter 107. We've been studying the book of Jonah uh, for about six or seven weeks now upstairs in the Sunday school class. And uh, I guess tonight's message and this morning's message kind of, her stuff, uh, I've kind of been... Uh, challenged by through that, I guess tonight I might just talk about the book of Jonah and things I've learned from that, but this was kind of something I specifically really spoke to my heart a couple weeks ago, or probably about a month ago now, I guess, yeah. in Sunday school, um, and uh, we're going through using this book by David Jeremiah called The Runaway Prophet, it kind of goes through the book of Jonah, but this was a specific topic that I, uh, and it kind of re- zoned in on this chapter, it really spoke to my heart. Um, Psalm chapter 107, I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but I will, I will as we go along here, but um, I guess before we get started, I'll, I'll open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can come together uh, as a one local body and open your word together and look at it, and God, we pray that through your spirit that you'll challenge us this morning and speak to our hearts, and God, um, and uh, we just thank you how your word does not return void, and so Lord, we can bank on that this morning, so we just thank you for that, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, it says in verse 43, I'm going to start at the end of the chapter, actually, it says, uh, whoso is wise will obtain, or sorry, will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. I guess to start off this morning, I was going to ask the question, how would you define the loving kindness of God? If someone said, what is loving, the loving kindness of God, what does that mean? Um... Is that just that God loves everyone, or is it, must have something to do with the fact that Jesus uh, loves people so much that he died for them, and I, I think everyone understands that. I think if you walked up to a stranger on the street who rarely darkens the door of a church, they could probably tell you, they could probably associate God with love and expound on that to, to some degree. I don't think that's a, a very uh, deep thing or something that's not unknown, I guess. Um, maybe, when, maybe when you're younger, you're, you, I know this has definitely happened to me, um, you, you knew a song from when you were younger, and you just sing it all the time, sing it. and as you get older, you look at the lyrics of that song, and you say, wow, is that actually what that means? Uh, maybe I shouldn't be singing that. Like, but when you're younger, you don't understand what it means. A TV show, you saw something, and you're like, I didn't really understand. And then you're like, ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't be watching that. Maybe I shouldn't be listening to that song. That's what those words and lyrics mean. Oh, yeah. Um, We can hear and say words so easily and quickly and lack the knowledge of what the true meaning is, you know, and I think we can look at, I think the word love is obviously thrown around quite loosely in circles today. Um, In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 8, it says, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. It says it's a wise thing to understand the loving kindness of of God. If you understand this, it's wise. And whoever loves wisdom loves his own soul. I love the Psalms and Proverbs quite a bit. Um, it's kind of like a really easy thing to go to in the morning in your devotions and, and read. And it's always a, a blessing or a challenge. Um, but I love the Psalms and Proverbs because living in such an intellectual world, um, I used to do some street evangelism 
uh, especially when I was in Bible school, not really much anymore, but we used to go on the university campus in, Saint, in Fredericton, and I was just talking to Brock, the guy who was speaking at the men's breakfast this uh, Saturday, I was just talking to him about this a couple weeks ago, how we, 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 we met up with a guy on the Fredericton UNB campus, started telling him about the Lord, and he was into Baha'i, you know, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that, it's a certain, I don't know if it's like a Middle Eastern religion, I don't even know much about it, but, and, and just the words this guy was using and the depth he was going into, you're just like, you know, like, this is not something for a Saturday afternoon, <laughs> I don't know, like, it was way out there, um, but, you, you know, you talk to some people and, and their beliefs, Chelsea and I have been watching some Ray Comfort last week, and, uh, some, of, some people's expl- explanations of why we're here or, or who God is, you're just like, what on earth? Yeah. And you're like, what are they talking about? Like, your purpose here, and I just, they use all these big words and all these, everything is so subjective. And it's like, do you even know what that means yourself? I believe God is the universe, you know, and he's in the air, and the air we breathe. And blah, blah. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> and I, people don't know what they, like, people don't even know what they're saying. Um, so living in such like an intellectual world, people think very deeply, and they, they know the meaning of life, they know it so well, they don't even know it. Um, but, um, you know, these books talk about the wisdom of God, like wisdom, knowing wisdom, knowledge, understanding, that's what Psalms, and especially Proverbs, is really about. So it's kind of, in a world like this, it's, it, it's, these are really good books to go to. These books say that wisdom comes from knowing God and knowing about God. Well, the smartest people in the world would say, will be atheists probably, and so they're actually not very wise or, or smart. To have a correct view of God, the Bible says, is the first step to wisdom, to being wise. Um, and you're dumb if you, if you don't take any consideration to who God is. Psalm chapter 143, verse 8 says, Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. Lord, cause me to attend to and listen to thy loving kindness, to know about, to think about, to consider it. In the morning, for in thee I do trust, cause me to know the way and where I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Do we understand the loving kindness of God? It says in verse 43, someone who is wise, even they shall understand, they'll observe these things. And we can say this about a lot of scripture. If you observe the scriptures, now even these shall understand the loving kindness of of God, but it's obviously specifically talking about this passage. Do we understand the loving God like we understand? I think Elvis in here. <laughs> Do we understand the loving God, loving God like we understand that we should be eating healthy food, but we eat unhealthy food, but we are unhealthy because we like eating unhealthy food and wonder why we're unhealthy? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. is that how we understand the loving kindness of God? Maybe we have heard it taught, probably know a generic definition of what the loving kindness of God is, love of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God. We hear these terms talked about quite frequently and think about them, I'm sure, and maybe have an understanding of them. But maybe understanding what it means for us and how it should affect us has probably not been a priority. And I think this is probably what this is getting at. Loving kindness, loving someone with no reason to love them. What does the Bible mean by the loving kindness of God? Well, another translation, it says that the loving kindness of God is translated the steadfast love of God. In the complete word study of the Old Testament, it actually says that this, this word in the Old Testament is one of the most important words in the Old Testament, this, love, this word loving kindness. It can also be translated mercy, and we see that in verse 1, the mercy of God. I'm not going to try and... Uh, pronounce this, I believe it's Hebrew word, um, but uh, I'll, I'll try my best, but it says the act of uh, chastity, chastity, I think, chaste, chaste, presupposes the existence of a relationship between parties involved. Where no normal relationship had previously been recognized, the person's ex- exercising of this word has chosen to treat the recipient as if such a relationship did exist. It's like going up to a random person and calling them mum or dad, or treating them like they're your mum or dad, or treating them like you're your brother. You've known them for a thousand years, and it's like, what's your name? <laughs> yeah. Who are you? <laughs> you know, that's what this word means. That's what love and kindness means. It means, it means treating someone with, as if you've already had a relationship with them before, even though there was no relationship before. And it's like, that doesn't even make any sense. Well, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 kind of drives home this 
thought, and we know this verse very well. It says, but God shows his love toward us so that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That, that, that's right there is the loving kindness of God, that while we are still sinners, while we are on the opposite, you know, the, the other side of the gorge <laughs> from God, right? We were in a rela- fellowship with God. He still died for us, still loved us, still showed his love toward us. Um, treating a stranger with the same love you treat the person you love the most in the world. You know, the type of, this type of love is not really familiar to the average person. I, I work for myself, do like carpentry and landscaping and stuff, and um, everyone you talk to wants you to make, cut them a deal. They want, you to, they want the lowest price, or, or you're charging too much, or whatever it is. Or, and uh, and uh, you know, obviously, maybe it's my lack of loving kindness, but I think to myself, and maybe say to some of my close friends and family members, say, I'm sorry, but I can't give everybody a deal. <laughs> you know, that's just the truth, right? Um, but maybe, maybe for my brother or sister, maybe for my mom or my grandmother or my or whatever. But you're a stranger I just met, and I would love to complete this job, but I can't give you the family discount. <laughs> you know, and, and that's just the truth. And I'm sure if uh, others in this in the same situation, they you know what I mean. Um, but loving kindness and mercy and care are often revolve around to whom it is worthy, right? That's, that's, that's just, that's just uh, human nature to think that way. I'm only going to love you if I have a reason to love you. Well, give me a reason why I should love you. Well, if it's your mom or dad or your wife or child, or, you have tons of reasons, right? And the list is endless. But if I just met you, um, like, well, I, don't, I guess I'll love you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, you throw that word around so easy, but... To show the same kind of love I would show for my wife or my daughter to a random person seems strange. Um, this loving kindness, steadfast love, is, it's, it's hard enough to show to a family member, right? To show this love that is, um, you know, this deep, deep kind of love that we, and then we're going to talk about that. To a family member, it's harder to show to a friend. It's unlikely to show to an acquaintance, but it's impossible to show to an enemy. I'm not going to show that kind of love to an enemy, um, and especially thinking about Romans chapter 5, verse 8, dying for someone you, you know, who's an enemy of you, right? Yeah. Sadly, and then thinking more about this, sadly our enemies can be found inside our church walls, right? I can be in here this morning and my enemy can be sitting three rows back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but, but uh, I wasn't talking about Graham, I promise. <laughs> no, but it's the truth though, right? Like our... Uh, you think of our enemies as someone who's very unlike us, does not share any values that we do, and has done something wrong to us, or hurt our feelings, or hurt somebody we know. Those are our enemies, right? Yeah. But sadly, the people that are supposed to be the closest, uh, the closest people to us are supposed to be our fellow Christians, fellow followers of Christ, right? People who have given their lives to Christ and uh, trust in the Lord. And sadly, our enemies can be found within these church walls, within this local body. And even inside of our homes, we find ourselves... Uh, in our family, in our even immediate families, just not getting along with siblings or children or parents or or whatever whatever the situation is, immediate family members amongst our circles, even bickering and, and or gossiping and going on about people that are other Christians, even from other places that you're just you have nothing good to say about them, and and um, it would easily be found in that differing opinions stuff, especially in the last few years. Everyone's got so many opinions about everything, and everyone's right. <laughs> and uh, differing opinions, stubborn attitudes, lack of forgiveness, plaguing the hearts of many professing Christians. Love has almost been taken to be more of a worldly term. You see love uh, plastered all over billboards, associated with things that God hates, thrown into all kinds of secular circles. Love yourself, love is love. Love that excuses sin rather than saves from sin. Love is sadly associated with practices that God hates. Think of the Psalm 107. I'm just going to read the first two verses. It says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, um, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And this just sound, this, is, this is the Lord right here, redeemed from the enemy. He is, if you're a child of God here this morning, God has redeemed you. From the enemy. Have you ever thought about this? Do you, do, you, do you know how much sin would be in the world if people were thankful to God? Just think about that. If people were thankful to God, how much sin would there be in the world? There wouldn't be any. 
Think of the original sin. If you think about Satan and his fall, if, if people were just thankful and recognized God and what they've done for him and who he is, there wouldn't be any sin, right? Sin is all, is, is all surrounded around self-centeredness and me, 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 right? And I don't have enough. I need more. That's what sin that's what that, is at the root of all sin. Failure to give God glory by recognizing God and his attributes. We don't give glory to God for who he is and what he has done and, and what he has done for us and his, his, his everyday graces to us, even to people who have rejected him and who aren't walking with God. God is still gracious. God is still giving 7.9 billion people an opportunity to give their lives over to him. The, the today is the day of salvation, right? Failure to give God glory by recognizing God and his attributes are at the roots of all sin. The same word in verse 43, saying loving kindness, is actually seen in verse 1, um, translated mercy. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. You know, we have an endless list of things to be thankful to God for, and we know this. And his goodness, and his mercy, and his forever enduring loving kindness and mercy are one of them, and the fact that he's redeemed our soul from eternity. And those are things that, just right there, his enduring mercy and loving kindness, his goodness, his redemption, those are things right there we can constantly thank God for and have endless gratitude. But the truth is, you'll either be thankful and have a long list of, uh, long list reflecting your gratitude, or you'll be unthankful and you'll have a long list reflecting your sin. Either way, you'll have a list that you're reflecting every day that describes who you are. If you are unthankful, you do not understand the loving kindness of God. So I, know, I know about God. I know God loves everybody. It's like, well, you, you, yeah, you can know the facts about it. Just like you can know the fact about that Jesus did die for everyone, that Jesus did rise again. We just celebrated that, that God loves, that God, you know, and, all, and the gospel, we can understand all the facts. But do we understand it and have we applied it to our own lives? Continuing on thinking about ungratefulness, I think this is really at the core of a lot of this, um, not understanding God and, and, and his love, his loving kindness specifically. Ungratefulness is listed under the list of characteristics of people in the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, uh, it emphasizes how in the last days some will depart from the faith. They get into all kinds of stuff, forbid from marriage, um, which you see all that kind of stuff, People forbidding from meats, things that God prepared to be taken with thanksgiving. Um, people stop taking that and they say it's not good anymore. Well, we see all kinds of that. We're going to be talking about that some. Um, it's things that God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. In verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. It is to be received with thanksgiving. Well, people are rejecting all kinds of things that God has um, created to be taken for good, to eat, to consume, and they're saying, oh, this isn't good, and this is, uh, and anyways. Ungratefulness opens up a world of sin. Psalm 63, verse 3 says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. You gotta ask, what, what's better than life? What's better than life? Nothing's better than life. I don't have life. What do I got, Right? If you, don't have, you don't have anything if you don't have life. You see, at the end of the day, you could, you could live your whole life and make a gazillion dollars, and at the end of the day, you're still going to die, and you can't take it with you. So what's better than life? Nothing. The Bible says God, Jesus, is better than life. His loving kindness is better than life because he can still, because you can still have the breath in your lungs, but, but, but have no life apart from Jesus Christ. God's loving kindness directs our mind and heart beyond the life we hold so dearly, structuring our cares and priorities around eternal life with the Savior who so cares for us. Thinking further on Psalm 107, and there's four examples here in Psalm 107 of people who experience God's loving kindness and, and, and very relatable, um, re relatable um, examples for God shows his loving kindness, his steadfast love, his mercy to people who are ungrateful, undeserving, and helpless. So number one is, is in found in verse three, it says, I'll start in verse two. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, 
whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in, solitary, in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. People want a place to live, right? They don't want to be wandering in the wilderness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. So what's happening here? You know, God redeems them. He brings them out. He, and what do they do? They end up wandering in the wilderness. They end up going a different way. God says, go this way. And I guess this is kind of thinking about the story of Jonah in the last couple months. God says to go west, I think it was, and he goes east, or vice versa. He goes the exact opposite direction. And in these, in, in these instances here, God says, I redeemed you, I brought you out. And where do they end up going in the wilderness? They end up into the desert. God is good and he redeems, but gratefulness and recognition to God are absent here in verse 3. Did they find goodness, mercy, redemption on their journey in the wilderness, in the desert. What did they find? What did they find in the wilderness, in the desert? <clears throat> they find a dry mouth and an empty stomach. Who wants that? No one wants a dry mouth and an empty stomach. People want to be filled. People want, you know, to be, their thirst to be quenched, you know. John chapter 6, verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, where in the world can you go where that's true? There's nowhere in the world you can go. You go down and get a Big Mac in about an hour from now, and you're going to go and probably want another one by supper time. Probably not, actually. But, but you're going to be hungry by supper time, right? There's no place you can go where you'll never be hungry again and never thirst. You know, this life is marked by dissatisfaction. You always want more, and that's why, there's so, that's why billboard companies do so well. That's why there's so many internet streaming services that make so much money off ads, because they know how to get you, <laughs> right? Like, they know that you're always looking for something else. They know that you're always looking for a better deep fryer or a better bicycle or something, a car. And so they get you with the ads, and they, they know that you're not satisfied where you're at. There's always something better. What we have just won't cut it. This longing for something else will never, stop, will never stop apart from God. And if you think about that for a second, you think, where am I today? Am I apart from God? Am I walking with God? You think, I'm, I'm never satisfied. I'm never happy. I'm never pleased with where I'm at or pleased with what I have. And the truth is, you never will be apart from God. It says in verse 9, it says, For he satisfy, satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Who goes to the desert to find water and goes to the desert to find hungry? Someone who is dumb. Someone who's not very smart. Someone who's unwise. Someone who doesn't understand the God who just brought them out of whoever they needed to be brought out from. Deceive people into thinking there are greener pastures. We see these trends in our world today. People go further and further and deeper and deeper into wickedness, further and further away from God, trying to satisfy their thirst and hunger. Again, I recite verse 43. Whoso is wise will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of God. Consider this. Consider this scenario and reflect on the loving kindness of God. Secondly, verse 10, it says, Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of the Lord um, and contempt the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor and fell down, and there was none to help. And they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses, and he brought them out of darkness and the shadows of death, and break their bands in sunder. And oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. For he hath broken the gates of brass, cut down the, uh, the bars of iron asunder. Here we see people who have rebelled against the words and counsel of the Lord. They found themselves in prison and in hard 
labor. God's words and counsel, and, and we need to understand this, God's words and counsel are given from a perfect perspective. He's God. I don't know if it, probably a lot of you guys in here have been out to the bluff in, in the, the, the wonderful view you see when you get out of one portion of Sussex out in Dutch Valley there. Uh, that's a great view. Imagine going to the top of Mount Everest and looking out and thinking, man, I wish there was a better view than this. This is not very, there's got to be a better view than this. This isn't very nice, you know. That's crazy. That's the highest point in the world, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and and uh, I could be wrong, but, but um, there's no better view than that, right? You know, God's got the best view on life there is. And the best view and understanding about who you are and who you are in light of him. Because he's God and he's perfect and he created you. We often wait until we are really in our mess to cry out to God. And like it says in verse 12, there was none to help. None to help. And this individual finally cries out to God. You know, sin creates bondage and leaves us alone. I consider uh, Romans chapter 7 so often. And I'm not going to read that just for sake of time. But I, like, you, you, do, you do the things you don't want to do and you, do, and you don't do the things you do want to do. You know, that, that's where sin brings you. And, and you can check that out. In Romans chapter 7. But that is sin. It's sin's bondage. Sin's slavery. Yeah. And it, it never brings you to greener pastures. It never brings you to find your know, thirst quenched, your belly filled. You know, your, you never find that freedom. You never find better counsel or better instruction elsewhere. It just bring, it leaves you in bondage. We would be so wise to remind ourselves regularly that bondage, that the bondage sin creates and what life apart from God looks like. You know, those concrete barriers, bronze, iron barriers that we find ourselves chained up in before we're saved, but even because of choices we make when we are saved, you know, um, quenching God's spirit within us, disobeying God, these places we put ourselves in unnecessarily, you know, God wants to free us from that. God wants us to break God, and he can. He can break those barriers, and he, and he wants to. And we need, we need to remind ourselves of that and where God has brought us. Whoso is wise will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of God. Verse 17, it says, It says, Fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, are afflicted in their soul, horse, all manner of meat, and they draw near into the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works in rejoicing. Sinful decisions left them sick. That's what sin does. It actually takes away the joy that the things you find most joy in in life. It takes that joy. Who doesn't like eating in here? I love eating, you know, but like sin brings to your point your body can't even consume those wonderful things things anymore if you don't eat you die eventually all paths away from god lead to death dead ends destruction sin not not only is killing us by leading us in the desert to starve and dehydrate quenching us by imprisonment but it actually causes your physical physical body to kill itself destroys your body oh that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men these verses teach us that sin breeds death, but God gives life. Oh, who, whoso is wise will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of God. Now, verse 23, it says, They that go down to the sea in ships and that do business in great waters, they shall see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy winds, which lifteth up waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, and they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro, staggering like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth out them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm to calm, and that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet, so that he bringeth them out um, unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. You know, I, I was a fisherman for a season, lobster fisherman for a season. There's not probably top most five vulnerable places you can be in is probably on a boat, a lobster boat or a boat in general. There's not really too much between you and the bottom of the ocean, especially in a storm. And, 
You know, we see here that they cried unto the Lord and he delivers them from death and from the storm that is um, on the brink of taking their life. Whoso is wise will observe these things. All these people find themselves in pretty difficult situations and a lot of, and, um, because of, in which, what led them there was their sin. In this chapter, we see a God who loves those who do not deserve love and mercy. I see a God who loves and delivers when no one else can. A God who loves and delivers people who maybe shouldn't be delivered, who shouldn't be delivered. Verse 32, just to finish off this chapter, I know we're pressing for time, but it says, And let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people. Praise him in the assembly of the elders. He Turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground. He said, "You have the power to turn something upside down, and, and without explanation, he turneth the river." Uh, verse thirty-four: a fruitful land into barrenness, a wickedness uh, for the wickedness of them that d- dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city of habitation. And sow the fields uh, and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesses, blesses them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes, and causes them to wander in the wilderness, where there is no way. Yet seeth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh him families like stock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Now in these final verses of verse 32 on, we see in some of the verses we see a judge, but we also see a redeemer. And that's what we see throughout this whole passage. A God who is in control, um, but a God who is the redeemer. A God who will judge, a God who will redeem. Do you understand the loving kindness of God? Does, does the loving kindness of God mean that God is love and that he loves everyone so that he would never send anyone to hell? Like, is that what that means? Does it mean that as a Christian we can just live whatever way we want, keep asking for God for forgiveness? And just like these people in this passage, they are redeemed. God has taken them. God has shown that he is true and loving and caring. And they still go off and do their own thing. And he's got to redeem them again because he's so good. You know, is it just that we can run off, do whatever we want? God's going to be there. He's the big red button that we can just stomp when we need his help. The loving kindness is that God is love, life, holiness, justice, righteousness, creator, good, merciful, redeemer. And we pervert love, change its definition to fit our understanding and desires. Our life is leading to death and promotes death. We live unholy lives and unholy people, committing continual injustices in the face of our holy God, worshiping creation rather than the creator. That's what the scriptures say also. And for his mercy and goodness and his redemption, we are unthankful. Do we understand where that leaves us in light of an almighty, all-holy God? Your life goes against this God. Your life goes completely against who this God is. And, you know, that, that should scare us. That should leave us in a place of, you know, terror, you know, fear. And that's what the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to get to that place where we fear God and say, wow, I really am standing in not the right line of a God uh, that, is, that is not happy with the way my life looks and who I am. You see, I understand God's love. He loved us even though we were his, his strangers and enemies and he is gracious and merciful and redeemer. We understand that. But what does that mean to you? you know, we understand all that, but what does that mean to you? And how is that affecting your life today? How is that affecting your life tomorrow morning? When you walk out of here and your thoughts about certain people in this room or certain people or your family members or whatever or, your, or the government. <laughs> we were talking about that this morning in Sunday school. Um... You know, how does that affect you when you talk about federal government or, or you know, whatever? And I'm, and I'm not going to keep going on about that, but that, that's something that's spoken to me quite a bit and challenged me. You know, how has the fact of God's love changed you? Has God's unprecedented love changed you? You know, I know we're pressing for time, but I, I was thinking about this, and it really, 
It really, uh, when I was younger, maybe this isn't a good story, but I thought it really went along. But when I was younger, my, my friends and I, we, we used to like switch up bikes. We put big wheels in the front, small wheels in the back. We'd, we'd paint them up, do crazy things to them. And like our, behind my dad's garage, we had probably 100 bikes just from ones we pull out of the garbage and take parts off of. And this one, this one fellow we knew, he bought a brand new bike. And it just off the lot and brought it home. We said, Matt, we will make your bike the coolest bike. And it's a nice bike already, but we'll make it even better. So we brought it up to our house, and we stripped it right down. And we painted it for him, all kinds of colors. And his, he lived with his grandmother. And his grandmother showed up. And she ripped us up and down, side to side, rightfully so. And uh, what we obviously don't understand as kids. We're like, we're just trying to... He wanted this. He was happy as a clam. He had a big smile on his face, but... Um, but his grandmother obviously bought the bike. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you see the grandmother in the store from there on out, it's not really a, hey, how's it going? It's a, and maybe you keep walking, maybe you don't say anything at all. Um, and, you know, that's the way it is in life, right? You make a big mistake and you hurt somebody or cost somebody money or whatever, and, you know, it's just kind of like a nice wave walking by them or maybe no wave at all. Um, but with God, that's not the case. And, and the loving kindness of God we are always doing dumb things. You know, we're always doing wild things like that in the face of God. And he's like, well, you know, and, and you would think he's just going to rip us right up and down the middle, side to side, and you're not going to be able to talk to him anymore. And say, oh my, I, I, but we know from Hebrews 4 verse 6, for verse 16, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. You can come boldly unto the throne of grace. You can actually come to God because of what Christ has done, because Christ covered your sin, because his blood, he has forgiven you, he has saved you. If you're a Christian here today, well, if you're not a Christian, you can still do that. You can actually come to the Lord, ask for forgiveness, repent of your sin, and, and he will forgive you. You can come boldly because of what Christ has done on the cross. And if you're not, I mean, if you are saved and you find yourself on one of these paths, the Lord says, you can still come back to me. I'm not going to, you don't got to just do a little flip of a wave. You can actually come boldly to me and ask for forgiveness. We can be ashamed of our sins, but because Christ died for our sin on, on, on our behalf, died for the sin on our behalf, we can face God and tell Him what we have done, and He will forgive. What what a love that is! Do we do you know? And do we do we want to keep disappointing a God like that? I think that's really where the rubber meets the road with God's loving kindness. Is like, you no, know, God's forgiving. We've messed up again. God's forgiving. He loves us. He messed up again. He forgives us again. He messed up again. He forgives us again. And, but that's not how it works. Like, at one point, you've got to actually understand what the loving kindness of God is. It's not just a big red button, you know, like the Staples button. But it's actually, you know, you've got you to gotta learn to love God back and actually say, I'm not going to keep on sinning like this anymore. Are you crazy? I'm, I'm going to stay on the path he wants me to be on. Um, look how good he has been to me. Ungratefulness, lack of understanding and loving kindness has led you to be one of these individuals in Psalm 107. Miserable. You know, your thirst is never quenched. You know, you're always hungry for something more, something different. Never satisfied. Imprisoned and bound. As you know what God's word says, you know what's true, you know what you should be doing, but you're being disobedient. Um, and you've been, you know, you've been in church since the womb, but you, you're disobedient and are ignoring God's word, making sinful decisions, maybe that have caused you to become physically ill. You find yourself in a vulnerable spot and are in a storm on the brink of perishing. But God... But call out to God and ask for forgiveness and repent. Understand that God's love is supposed to transform us to be like him. More like God means less like the, the old man the, uh, of the world. You do not keep turning back, but you press on toward the high mark of the calling of God. We can stop allowing sin to imprison us as we feed, as we've been freed by the blood of Jesus. If it seems impossible for you to be freed from your sin in this life, God's love and mercy is sufficient for you so you can find salvation through his son. Understanding the loving, God, loving kindness of God is to understand that God wants you to obey him because you love him and want to do what's right as you have experienced his loving kindness. If God's loving kindness is just a fact or a note to you, you do not understand him or his love and you may not even know him at all. Just in closing, I just want to turn to 1 John. In this, 1 John chapter 4, and this really is the, the, the book of God's love, um, and, and that really drives home that God, in his character, is love. He's not just a loving God, but he is love. 
And so you will not know love apart from God. Not that God has like a better kind of love than this other God over there, this other person, or he understands it better or something. But he is love, and you'll never experience true love apart from him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Understanding God's love is, is learning to love him in response in light of his love toward us. In, in light of his, him sending his son to die for us on the cross, it transforms us so that we can know his love and we can live in that love and we can share that love through the new life we have in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you loved us so much that you did send your son to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, that we, thinking of Psalm 107 and Lord, all these messes we get ourselves in, and uh, each one of us in here in this room have been in all kinds of messes, I'm sure, but Lord, if we are saved here today, we know that you have redeemed us for our souls from hell and from eternal destruction and from separation from you, but Lord, even as we so easily, God, as we, we do not probably understand your loving kindness to where we should, but we easily go back to where we shouldn't be and in paths we shouldn't be on. Lord, we just ask for forgiveness for that. And um, Lord, I pray, God, that we will seek to have a deep understanding of your love for us and your care for us and, um, and how you want us to live that life that you have called us to live and with that high calling that you have called us to. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Closing this morning, I'm not sure which hymn it is. But we'll just, we'll sing the first verse of follow on. I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We'll just sing the first verse of follow on.